Today is July 9th, 2014. We're at the Dhammasukha Meditation Center with Bhante Vimala Ramsey. Today he'll be doing the, from the Majjhima Nikaya number 142, the exposition of the offering, the Dakina Vibhanga Sutta. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living in the Sakyan country of Kapvilavatu in Negrodas Park. Then Mahapajapati Gotami took a new pair of cloths and went to the Blessed One. After paying homage to him, she sat down at one side and said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, this new pair of cloths has been spun by me, woven by me, especially for the Blessed One. Venerable Sir, let the Blessed One accept it from, from me out of compassion. When this was said, the Blessed One told her, give it to the entire Sangha, Gotami. When you give it to the Sangha, both I and the Sangha will be honored. A second time and third time she said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, accept it from me out of compassion. A second and third time the Blessed One told her, give it to the Sangha. If it's an individual gift to somebody, you don't get very much merit. But when you give it to the entire Sangha, you get lots and lots and lots of merit. When you give it to the Sangha, both I and the, and the Sangha will be honored. Then the Venerable Ananda said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, let the Blessed One accept the new pair of cloths from Mahajapati Gotami. Mahajapati Gotami has been very helpful to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir. As his mother's sister, she was his nurse, his foster mother, the one who gave him milk. She suckled the, the Blessed One when his own mother died. The Blessed One, too, has been very helpful to Mahapajapati Gautami, Venerable Sir. It is owing to the Blessed One that Gautami has gone for refuge to the Buddha, Dhamma, and the Sangha. It is owing to the Blessed One that Gautami abstains from killing living beings, from taking what is not given from misconduct and sensual pleasures, from false speech, and, f and from wine, liquor, and intoxicants, which are the basis of negligence. It is owing to the Blessed One that Gotami possesses unwavering confidence in the Buddha, Dhamma, and the Sangha, that she possesses the virtues loved by noble ones. It is owing to the Blessed One that Gotami is free from doubt, from suffering, from the origin of suffering, about the cessation of suffering, and about the way leading to the cessation of suffering. The Blessed One has been very helpful to Gotami That is so, Ananda, that is so. When one person owing another has gone for refuge to the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, I say that it is not easy for the former to repay later by paying homage to him, rising up for him, according him reverential salutation and polite services and by providing robes, alms, food, resting place, and medicinal requisites. When one person is owing to another, 
has come to abstain from killing living beings, from taking what's not given, from misconduct and sexual pleasures, from false speech and from wine, liquor and intoxicants, which are the basis for neg negligence, I say that it is not easy for the former to repay the latter by paying homage to him. So when you're going to the refuge to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha and you, you are pure by keeping the precepts and it's um, very sincere even giving a gift is very small compared to taking these uh, these other uh, doing these other things there's a sutta in I think it's the Anguttara Nikaya that spells this out much more plainly and I'll, I'll have to check that and get back to you when one person owing to another has come to possess unwavering confidence in the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, and to possess the virtues loved by noble ones, I say that is not easy for the former to repay the latter by paying homage to him. <clears throat> when one person owing to another has become free from doubt about suffering, about the origin of suffering, about the cessation of suffering, about the way leading to the cessation of suffering. I say that it is not easy for the former to repay the latter by paying homage to him and giving requisites. There are 14 kinds of personal offerings, Ananda. One gives a gift to the Tathagata, accomplished and fully awakened. This is the first kind of personal offering. One gives a gift to a Pacheka Buddha. This is the second kind of personal offering. One gives a gift to an Arahat, disciple of the Tathagata. This is the third kind of personal offering. One gives a gift to one who has entered upon the way by realization of the fruit of arahatship. This is the fourth kind of personal offering. One gives a gift to a non-returner. This is the fifth kind of personal offering. One gives a gift to one who has entered upon the way to the realization of the fruit of non-return. This is the sixth kind of offering. One gives a gift to a once returner. This is the seventh kind of offering. One gives a gift to one who has entered upon the way to the realization of the fruit of once return. This is the eighth kind of offering. You understand all this so far. One who gives a gift to a stream enterer. This is the ninth kind of personal offering. One gives a gift to one who has entered upon the way to the realization of the fruit of stream entry. This is the tenth kind of personal offering. One gives a gift to one outside the dispensation who is free from lust for sensual pleasures. This is the eleventh kind of personal offering. Now, even if they're outside the dispensation, if their mind is pure from one-pointed concentration, okay, that's, that's what we're talking about here. One gives a gift to a virtuous, ordinary person. This is the twelfth kind of personal offering. 
one gives a gift to an immoral ordinary person. This is the thirteenth kind of personal offering. One gives a gift to an animal. This is the fourteenth kind of personal offering. Why don't you make up a chart that shows that? And uh, by giving a gift to an animal, the offering may be expected to repay a hundredfold. By giving a gift to an immoral, ordinary person, the offering may be expected to repay a thousandfold, even to an immoral person. By giving a gift to a virtuous, ordinary person, the offer may be expected to repay a hundred thousandfold. So sharing your, your food with virtuous people comes back quite often. By giving a gift to, to one outside the dispensation who's free from lust for personal pleasures or sensual pleasures, the offering may be expected to repay a hundred thousand times, a hundred thousand fold. A hundred thousand times a hundred thousand is what? So a hundred thousand times a hundred thousand, you got to add six zeros. Well, no, that's it's trillion or quadrillion. By giving a gift to those who has entered upon the way to the realization of the fruit of stream entry, the offering may be expected to repay incalculably, immeasurably. What then should be said of giving an offering to a regular stream enterer who just has the path? What should be said of giving a gift to those who have entered upon the way of the realization of the fruit of once return? Of, and once return or with the fruit to one who has entered upon the way to the realization of the fruit of non-return or to a non-returner. To one has entered upon the way to the realization of the fruit of arahatship or to an, a regular arahat with, with is just the path. To a Pacheka Buddha, what should be said about giving a gift to a Tathagata accomplished and fully awakened? There are seven kinds of offering made to the Sangha Ananda. One gives a gift to the Sangha of both monks and bhikkhunis, headed by the Buddha. This is the first kind of offering made to the Sangha. And that's what I was taught in Burma. That's the highest. By far. So the, the monk that you're giving it to is just the representative of the Sangha. There's a story about this one monk that was not a very good monk. And he was always asking for things. And this man that was very pious came up and he offered food to that monk on a, an occasion when there was a lot of people and a lot of monks. <clears throat> and he was very, very respectful. And in his mind, he, he didn't see the individual, he saw the, the Buddha at the head of both Sanghas. And then after the meal, this monk came around because he was impressed by the piety of that person and asked to use something, and the, the man put it on the ground and kicked it to him, which is very high insult. 
and he asked the man, why, why did you, you were so pious giving me the food, why are you doing this? And he said, I was giving it to the entire Sangha when I was giving you the food, but this is a personal gift. One gives a gift to a Sangha of both the monks and bhikkhunis after the Tathaga has, has attained final Nibbana. This is the second kind of offering made to the Sangha. One gives a gift to the Sangha of bhikkhus. Sneeze. This is the third kind of offering made to the Sangha. One gives a gift to a Sangha of bhikkhunis. This is the fourth kind of gift offering made to the Sangha. One gives a gift saying, appoint so many monks and, and monks and bhikkhunis for, for me from the Sangha. So it means you, you say, I want to give this gift to 50 monks and 50 bhikkhunis. It's not to the entire Sangha, it's just to those, those 50 or 100 people. Okay, one gives a gift saying, appoint so many bhikkhus for me from the Sangha. This is the sixth kind of offering made to the Sangha. One gives a gift saying, appoint so many bhikkhunis for me from the Sangha. This is the seventh kind of offering made to the Sangha. In future times, Ananda, there will be members of the clan who are yellow necks, immoral, of evil character. People who will give gift to those immoral person for the sake of the Sangha, even then I say an offering is made to the Sangha is of incalculable, immeasurable. And I say that in no way is a gift to a person individually ever more fruitful than offering made to the Sangha. There are, Ananda, four kinds of purification of offerings. What for? There is the offering that is purified by the giver, not by the receiver. The receiver doesn't understand what you're doing, like that monk. There is the offering that is purified by the receiver, but not the giver. An immoral person gives something to someone that's moral. And when you're receiving the gift, I was taught in Burma that I should always be focusing on loving kindness. And how is the offering purified by the giver, not by the receiver? Here, the giver is virtuous, of good character, and the receiver is immoral, of evil character. Thus, the offering of purified by the giver, not by the receiver. And how is the offering purified by the receiver, not by the giver? Here, the giver is immoral of evil character, and the receiver is virtuous of good character. This is the offer, this, thus the offering is purified by the receiver, not by the giver. And how is the offering purified neither by the giver nor by the receiver? Here the giver is immoral of evil character and the receiver is immoral and of evil character. Thus the offering is purified neither by the give, giver nor the receiver. 
And how is the offering purified by both the giver and by the receiver? Here the giver is virtuous of good character and receiver is virtuous of good character. Thus the offering is purified by both the giver and by the receiver. These are the four kinds of purification of offerings. So purification means it, it adds more value to the offering. That's right. It depends, uh, it depends on the giver. If the giver is giving with a pure mind, it's purified. Monks aren't supposed to talk, touch a, a Donna box, but there are laymen around that do and can. And they can put that in a fund just for the Sangha or they can use that fund for extra food for the Sangha or lodging or medicine. Unless they specify that they want you to have the, you personally to have this dana and use it in a way that is helpful your copy is supposed to take care of that and get whatever uh, is needed at the time. Uh, there have been times when the copy starts thinking that that money that's offered is theirs and there's a, a special kind of it's almost like a ritual of the monk stands in front of the kapiya. He doesn't mention anything about what's, what's needed, but the, the kapiya does understand that there's something wrong and will ask what is the problem and then the monk can reply. And if they don't ask, then you do it a second time and a third time, up to six times. Now this is according to Vinaya. And if, if the, that kapiya still doesn't do what, what's needed to be done, then the, the monk will go to the head monk and tell about the problem. And he, the head monk will get another copy to approach them and tell them, you're not fulfilling your, your uh, duties as an attendant for this monk. And they can ignore that or not. But after after six times of of doing it, the monk can't it doesn't do any more outside of go to the head monk and the head monk gets an attendant to go approach and try to talk that person into giving up whatever they're holding for that monk. And if they give it up, then that attendant will, will find another attendant to help the monk that was orig originally had the gift. And that's real easy to do in countries that are Buddhist. It's relatively difficult doing it uh, in uh, non-Buddhist countries because attendants don't really understand. I, I, I was taught for two years by Usila Nanda on how to be an attendant and he was always coming up with new stuff that I'd never heard before. He'd point at a flower and he'd say, make that allowable. 
And what he wanted me to do was cut the flower and then give it to him. So sometimes I'll say make it allowable. And that that's what the, the Pali is uh, you have to say kapia bante as you're giving the whatever it happens to be. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Allowable, right? Allowable, yeah. That's what, a, that's what kapia really means. A person that makes it allowable. But being in this country, sometimes a copy is available and sometimes they're not. So we wind up having to carry some, some form of money around just so that we can do the things we need to do. That is what the Blessed One said. When the Sublime One had said that, the teacher said further, when virtuous, a virtuous person to an immoral person gives with trusting heart a gift righteously obtained, placing faith in the fruit of that action is great. The giver's virtue purifies the offering. When an immoral person to a virtuous person gives with untrusting heart, a gift unrighteously obtained, nor places faith in the fruit of that action is great. The receiver, receiver's virtue purifies the offering. When an immoral person to an immoral person gives with untrusting heart a gift unrighteously obtained, nor places faith in the fruit of the action is that the fruit of the action is great. Neither virtues purifies the offering. When a virtuous person to a virtuous person gives with trusting heart a gift righteous, righteously obtained, placing faith in the fruit of the action is great. That gift, I say, will come to full fruition. When a passionless person to a passionless person gives with trusting heart a gift righteously obtained, placing faith that the fruit of the action is great, the gift, I say, is the best of the worldly gifts. So be virtuous and give to a virtuous person knowing that that gift will come back at some point. Can't put a time scale on it, unfortunately. But there, there was a, um, a layman that he donated a lot. And for one reason or another, he, and he was donating continually to the Sangha, entire Sangha. And for one reason or another, he was broke. And he made a determination that I have given so much to the Sangha, now it's time for that to come back a little bit. And he won the lottery. <laughs> it wasn't a big lottery. It was like five or ten thousand ringgit. It wasn't a, a huge amount of money, but it was it was enough for him to <coughs> continue on. He later became a monk, and that used to be one of his favorite stories. So the whole idea of practicing your generosity by being a virtuous person 
even when you give to somebody that is really rough around the edges, that will come back to you many hundreds of thousands of times. And in many different ways. It's not always monetarily. It comes back as prosperity. You have when you're when you're known as a generous person, people like you because you're generous, because you can help other people and they like that as an example. So there's another way of explaining the imaging of prosperity. And prosperity has it comes in all different forms. It comes in the form of meeting the right person at the right time. That you both can benefit from that meeting, that sort of thing. So virtue is, is a, or prosperity is, is a, as big a word as a lot of Pali words like Dhamma, many things. Unfortunately, in this culture, most people think prosperity means money. But when you pay attention to what you're doing, and you make a, a, a plan to do something, and if you run into roadblocks, and you keep having to overcome these problems that keeps happening after two or three times, your prosperity is telling you not to continue. But when you make a plan to do something and it's like the whole universe is there saying, yeah, and everything just happens by itself more or less, you know that's the right path that you need to be taking. And that comes from the merit of giving. Too much people are tied up in the idea of Donna means you have to give, you have to pay me to support me. And it's really sad looking at some of these people that write, come to my website, the first thing they do is ask you for money. Well, <laughs> you have to give before you can get. And what you do is you give the Dhamma. And Dhamma takes care of you. You don't have to worry about things. So the more you put trust in that and keep practicing your generosity in body, speech, and mind, then you become, it becomes of great benefit. That's one of the things it says a lot about keeping your, your virtue in Sutta number 46. It talks about keeping your, your precepts very well. And when you do, it is of great benefit for you. That means you prosper very well. So, that's the end of the sutta. It's a short one. 